podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people? That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest, I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just I don't get it. Welcome to Welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hey everyone, welcome to Smart People Podcast. Glad to have you back. Look, let's get into it. This episode is real. This is definitely what I had in mind way back a decade ago when we started this podcast. It's a raw conversation. I learned a lot. I think you can hear that. We're talking with Dr. Sasha Hines. And yes, her bio reads like a smart person. Undergrad from Harvard, Master's in Applied Positive Psychology from UPenn, PhD in Developmental Psychology from Columbia. She has a thriving coaching business. She was in the first class to go through the incredible positive psychology master's program at UPenn. But much more than that, I went on her website. I learned about her. I watched her videos. I really like a lot of the things she has to say about mindset, about our goals, about imposter syndrome, and ultimately about uncovering what's real in this world. Now, obviously, mindset is something we've covered a few times recently. It's kind of a kick that I'm on, but I just can't shake this feeling that it's truly the most important thing we can hone, we can improve. And along with that is everything else, how to feel our real feelings, how to be open to them, how to interpret them. So like I said, it's a real episode. Now, I'm trying to keep this intro short. One thing I do want to say is we received a very thoughtful, well-written message from somebody who was voicing their opinion on sponsors and not necessarily loving episodes being broken up by sponsors. And first of all, we really appreciate any feedback. We responded to them. It was a great learning opportunity. The other thing is, in an hour of content, we might have four or five minutes of sponsors. And truly, I think the podcasting medium has been great for highlighting some really incredible companies. And I hope that you take a chance to listen to those. And if it's something that you're thinking about, go check it out. Use our links. Not only does it support the show, it's a huge reason we've been able to do this podcast for literally a decade. But here's the alternative. If you really can't stand them, if you become a Patreon supporter for $5 a month, you get ad-free episodes sent directly to your podcast player, just like any other podcast. You don't have to do anything technologically difficult. It's basically a click of a button and no more ads. Either way, we're putting a value to the content we put out and we appreciate you listening and being a part of it. Of course, comments and recommendations are always welcome. You can reach us at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com. So without further ado, let's sink into this one. So excited to talk to Dr. Sasha Hines in this episode. If you want to learn more, she is at drsashahines.com. Can't wait to bring you this one. Enjoy it. You know, I have to say, when we created this, uh, this podcast and we said, let's talk to smart people, this is what I had in mind. Let's go through your bio for a second. Okay, PhD, you have a master's in applied positive psychology. You are a developmental psychologist and life coach. You have your undergraduate from Harvard, your PhD from Columbia, and your MAPP from UPenn. Your bio reads like somebody who said, how do I go to the best schools and take the hardest classes? How did this come to be? Uh, it's so funny because I, both my parents met at Harvard as undergraduates. So I just don't think I ever had a time in my life where I didn't think that that was the expectation, mm. period. Um, you know, and, and it's interesting because obviously the work that I do with my clients is so much about understanding how your thoughts, you know, create and shape your experience of life. And most importantly, how your thoughts generate your emotions and your emotions then create your actions, right? So your emotions are what are motivating your actions. Um, and this is plays out in all of us. And I had this unconscious, totally unconscious belief that, you know, that, that my expectation was to go to an Ivy league school. I, and I don't, I mean, I think it was, it be, maybe became more conscious later, but like the, the must of it 
was totally unconscious. Like, I didn't see how that was weird. (laughs) Well, are you thankful for that, though? Because sometimes I feel like this idea of thoughts, actions, all of that, I feel like it's just the secret sauce to, well, now let's just implant our children with these thoughts like go to Harvard and be happy and make money and all this stuff. And they'll just do it unconsciously and be better off than if we don't implant those thoughts in them. I know that's not true, but are you thankful for having that? Um, yeah, yes and no. Cause I think that, you know, y- yes. I mean, I'm really grateful that I had amazing opportunity to go to the schools that I did and I worked really hard to get there. Um, and, and I, and I am grateful that I think in some way I did have this myopic, focus. Like this is where you must go there. This is what's going to happen. You know, like I just, my entire, and, and, and by the way, I, I told my college advisor, my senior, you know, senior fall, you go in and you meet with your college advisor. And I remember walking in and saying, you know, and, and he's saying, okay, well, what are your, what schools, what's your second choice? What's your third tier? Like what, what other schools are you applying to? And I said, I'm not going to apply to any other schools. I'm applying to four schools. Um, and if I don't get in, to one of my top choices, I'm going to take a year off and reapply and work whatever and reapply. And he was just, I mean, he looked at my face and he said, okay, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you do that. But I was just absolutely, there was no, I, there was no other option. I was absolutely, I wasn't going to entertain any other option. It was like, this is what I'm doing. It's my story. I'm sticking to it. Yeah. And I, it's so funny because I look back and I'm like, gosh, <laughs> I was so directed and driven and I just didn't, Uh, But I didn't see that. I could I didn't really have any conscious awareness of it at the time. Did you know what you were going to do with all this schooling? I mean, when did this path of developmental psychology rear itself to you? No, I mean, not at all. I think that's really what happened is I, you know, goals, two things really manage our psychic entropy and psychic entropy is essentially when our internal worlds are very diffuse and chaotic Um, which by the way, nobody likes, it does not feel good. It feels very anxiety producing. So when our brains are unfocused and our, you know, cycle, our psychic energy or sort of psychological world is unfocused, um, it does not feel good. So there are a few things that we do as humans to manage that. And one of them is set goals, right? Because what is, what do goals do? They constrain us. So it's very easy to say like yes and no to things. We can put things in proper, you know, in really prioritize things. It becomes very clear what matters and what doesn't, right? Like what we're what we're going to do in this next hour becomes very clear. It doesn't require a lot of mental energy. I think a lot of people who fantasize about being entrepreneurs and working from home, like oh my gosh, that sounds like so much fun. It's like well, you know what happens. You have to become a master at managing psychic entropy because you don't have anybody telling you externally what to do. Right. Right. And which is its own skill um, and surprisingly difficult. So two ways we manage psychic entropy is having a goal or um, also asking questions. So think about like a research scientist has a question uh, uh, um, and hypotheses that sort of drive their thinking and constrain their thinking. So, you know, I had this goal in my early years to go to Harvard, I really, really wanted to go there. That was, that was the goal. Everything was about that. Um, and then I got there and not only was I in college and, you know, classes don't meet as frequently. I I'd been in a, in a high school that we had Saturday classes. So, I mean, I was in school, I felt like I was in school from like eight, it was a boarding school. So we went from eight until check-in at our dorms was like 10, 10 30. So there wasn't a minute of my day that wasn't scheduled and directed. So then I get to college and nothing is scheduled and directed except for a few hours of my week. And, and my big goal that was constraining everything was no longer there. And I mean, the great unraveling. (laughs) Yeah, I really, I really, I struggled big time with that. And it was, which was a, um, you know, didn't feel great and was unfamiliar. And I, I really was, I had a very hard time in college, just, um, you know, j- just did not have an easy time emotionally. And, uh, and I think so much of it looking back on it, I'm like, Oh, it's, yeah, that's exactly what happened. It's just like, you know, you lost your kind of reason to be and which is so silly, right? It's so silly that like my, what the big goal is like going to a college at 18, who cares? But 
from my, you know, teenage brain, that was it. And then I didn't know what was next. And also managing all of this sort of unstructured time. And man, I struggle with that. Well, I think you just defined so much of everyone's experience, myself included, where this podcast came from. It's kind of insane in that, and everyone knows my story, so I don't want to go too much down that line, but my goal was to make X amount of money. I mean, it was six figures by 25, seven figures by 30. That's it. Every decision between 16 and 22 was made off that. And then I got there, you know, to the six figures part. And lost it because that goal is hit and it wasn't, it, it actually didn't even meet the expectations that I had. This, I feel like is probably what most people come to you for. I feel like this is at the core of a lot of people's struggles is if we even accomplish the goals, they're not necessarily what we want. This idea of hedonism and all of that, which has a direct link to positive psychology. So I guess my first question to you around all this is, if goals help us constrain ourselves, but oftentimes they are not the end we want, what do we do? That I mean, this is such a good question. I think this is at the heart of it, right? It's like, this is, by the way, why sometimes, you know, life on Instagram can be so frustrating because there's a partial truth to everything. <laughs> there's like, there's a piece of what, you know, be a gold digger or whatever. Yeah, yeah sure. Great. Great. Setting goals is really a good thing. I'm I'm a big proponent of setting goals. I think there's so many awesome reasons to set goals. Um, I encourage all of my clients to set really big, tenacious, you know, impossible goals. But when we get into trouble is when we think that the goal, that the the you know the accomplishing of the goal, the end, is going to somehow make us feel better. It's going to solve some inner wound, right, or some inner need. And that is a terrible reason to set a goal. So I want to make a certain amount of money. The question is why? Why do you want to do it? Are you doing it because the challenge of it? Because you want to see what's possible for you to accomplish? Because you know that to get to that level of income, it's going to require you to up level your, you know, professionally. It's going to require you to, you know, show up um you, you know, just to mature as a, as a professional and to learn more and to develop more mastery. Like those are all great reasons to set a goal. Like, I'm all in when, if that's the reason, because all of those are intrinsically motivated, mm. right? If you're doing it from that internally driven place, but if the reasons that you're, you know, going after some goals, because you, there's some in there, there's some should or must, or, you know, I ought to, or it's something you think like culturally it's the right thing or it's, this is what will make my parents proud when the, the motivator is external to you. It's never going to work because you might grab the brass ring. Like you might achieve the goal, but it will never solve the need, right? The emotional and psychological need. What happens is you get on that treadmill and you're like, okay, here's, I achieved this. And then it feels awesome for five minutes. And then you're like, oh, I got to get back on because I need to get that other thing because I need to, right? It's like, I need to fill that void. Right. And I, the tough part is, I think, given, I'd say over the past decade or so, all of the research and the great books and just thought leaders in this space, I think that idea has become much more mainstream. The problem is, I think it's hard to take that idea and put it into practice. There's so many people who know this, yet still struggle with the same result, which I'm also imagining is something you deal with. So what is the positive psychology approach, or I could just say your approach to solving that issue? Well, I mean, I love getting clients that are at that point where they've just been on that achievement treadmill, just dogging it out and they're just done. And they just, and, and like the, what they'll describe is, I don't know what's wrong with me. I just, I just, I can't, I just don't feel motivated anymore. Right. And I'm like, right, this is great. You hit the brick wall. Wow. Excellent. Right. You got all the things you thought you wanted. So now you can heal. Heal. Tell me more about that. You can heal. That's an interesting term to use there, I think. Right. It's like they, they've gotten all the things that they thought were going to fill the void and make them feel better, more worthy. Like it always comes down to some not enoughness. Mm, that's what I was, I was thinking about. Do you believe that we're seeking? Well, what are we seeking? Do you think at its core? I mean, I think everybody's seeking a feeling of feeling worthy, feeling loved, feeling accepted. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I think that's at the core of everybody's, um, you know, need. Those are, those are, those are like, those are the basic psychological needs, right? Mastery, feeling good at what you do, Mm -hmm. um, or competence, mastery, uh, relatedness, so positive relationships with others and autonomy. So having some sense of feeling like you have choice, you're able to make choices Mm -hmm. in your life. Those are the three basic psychological needs. I'm sure many of our listeners aren't familiar with positive psychology. Tell us about that, which is really where I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, where your expertise lies, where a lot of your uh, coaching kind of comes from. And then what is the baseline of positive psychology to help people achieve that goal of, of feeling the emotion that they want? Well, so positive psychology really started as a response to the field of psychology around the turn of the millennium. So around like the year, you know, around 2000. So at the time, Martin Seligman was the president of the American Psychological Association. And he, um, you know, I, I think, you know, he gave a, a very famous, now famous speech uh, about questioning and challenging psychologists and the field um, about like where the, fo- where the research focus was, you know, every, for every, and I don't, there's a lot of different statistics here, but more or less it was like for every seven articles, um, written on disease and disorder, one was written on, um, health and wellbeing. So we had a far greater understanding of, you know, pathologies and psychological disorders and dysfunction than we did have an understanding of, psychological health and what that actually looks like and what are the correlates and causes of that and how do we cultivate it and what are people, you know, what is, what's going on when there's people have exceptional talents or they seem to be extremely resilient, right? They beat the odds. What's going on there? How can we deconstruct it? So it really, there was sort of a, not to say there weren't people, you know, there was like Emmy Werner and some other, um, Ed Diener was doing this research even before all this, but I think, um, you know, Seligman was on to something and saying, hold on a second here. This is not to say studying, you know, dysfunction is not important, but that we've lost a sense of balance in um, really trying to explore the full human experience. And now a quick word from this week's sponsor. You know what that sound means. The holidays are quickly approaching. Giving holiday gifts is great. Overspending on all those gifts is definitely not. So why spend more than you have to? Finding the lowest price is easy if you have Honey. Honey is a free browser extension that automatically finds the best promo codes whenever you shop online. This means you'll always get the best deals without even trying in over 20,000 sites such as Amazon, eBay, J.Crew, Sephora, Expedia, Target, Best Buy, and more. So I have to admit, I was doing a little holiday shopping for myself because I needed some pants. So I went over to J.Crew Factory picked out three pairs of chinos, added them to the cart. They were already on sale, but I still clicked the Honey Browser extension. It went through all the available promo codes and it found me an additional savings of $34.47. How awesome is that? I guess I'm just gonna have to take that savings and buy something for my wife. Don't tell her though, it's a secret. Honey has found its over 10 million members over a billion dollars in savings. Honey supports over 20,000 stores online and has over 100,000 five-star reviews on the Google Chrome store. So if you're buying gifts this holiday season, then you need Honey. If you're not, you probably know someone who is, so do them a solid and tell them about Honey. Honey can help make sure that you're getting the best price for whatever you're buying. It's free to use and installs in just two clicks. So get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash smart. That's joinhoney.com slash smart. And now back to the episode. How does that then translate to that person who has, let's say, hit that brick wall? Mm-hmm. You know, how, how how does this idea of positive psychology um, drive the conversation, perhaps as opposed to going to a, I don't know how you would call it, normally trained psychologist? <laughs> well, I mean, I think that, um, the I, I mean, First of all, I think that everybody should have the opportunity to see a wonderful, you know, a very high quality therapist. I think most people have experienced things in their life that they do need to process. Mm-hmm. Most people don't aren't 
no one teaches you how to process your emotions. No one teaches you how to have any kind of mastery over your mindset. Um, where is that in the curriculum? Nowhere. So, I mean, everybody has a human brain. Everybody has a condition. It's called being a human. You have a human brain. You need to learn how to manage it. And um, so, you know, I think that what positive psychology has done and coaching too, which is why I, I'm a coach and I love this modality and I love being able to work in this field is you don't have to have a pathology or you don't have to have a diagnosis to want to work on yourself, right? And to want to have a better experience in life and to have um, more autonomy in your experience of life, being able to be more deliberate about your mindset, right? You can learn how to do that. You don't need to have something wrong with you. Yes. Yes, that was one of the things that always drew me to positive psychology. As I mentioned, I looked into that curriculum. I love uh, Martin Seligman. I mean, I love that thought process because just because you want more for yourself, probably from an emotional perspective, doesn't mean that you have to have something wrong with you in the first place. I, I think I read somewhere, it was either on your website or as I was doing research, you were talking about, you know, it's not about going from negative to zero. And I really like that analogy. Like, how do we go from zero to where we want or or something along those lines? Exactly. And I think, you know, um, it's just a, something that's more strength based and approached in a different way. So it's saying like, yeah. And by the way, also what goes on with people is sometimes they have areas where they are really thriving and then they have these other areas in their life where they're like, I cannot get out of this, you know, like Sisyphean hell that I seem to be in. I do I'm banging my head up against the wall. I do the same thing every day, even though I know not to do it. You know, right? Like I'm incredibly frustrated, even though other areas of their life are very successful. It's it's not like we we can have a lot of variety and kind of um, you know it's very it's it's there can it, you can have areas where you're doing really well and some areas where you're not. Right? That's that's normal. Why do you find that is actually that's interesting because as you talk about this idea of really mastering our thoughts and how important they are, you would think that those who are successful in many areas have been able to overcome a lot of the challenges. So how come those habits don't, um, you know, flow into all areas of life per se? Right. I mean, basically there is, you know, which is the fun one of the things I think is very fun about my work with clients is that you have to sort of understand that there is a biography of these belief systems, right? So you could be someone who really believes that you're, um, you're really bright, uh, you know, you're really competent and capable. And so you've been very successful professionally and have a ton of, uh, a, you know, a belief system that may be very different about your physical health, right? And they're like totally incongruent, the two. I want to start with that, actually, this idea of belief systems, because as we've been learning on this podcast, we have talked to a lot of incredible people. And it is it is blowing my mind, this idea of the stories we tell ourselves, the belief systems we have. How do you think we can best identify negative beliefs and the ones that are actually being detrimental to our goals or the life we want to live? Um, I mean, the first place I would say is just if you do an inventory of your behaviors um, and look through each one of them, I mean, really true, like an honest inventory from the minute you wake up to the minute you go to bed, what are you doing throughout the day? If you were just to totally objectively without editing it, without criticizing it, you're just writing down, you know, every in 15 minute increments, like what are you doing? And then ask yourself, once you have this exhaustive list, is this, is the doing of this thing moving me towards my most valued self? So who I want to be, or is it moving me away from that person? Wow. Right. That's, that would give you a lot of information. What about doing the same exercise from a thought perspective? Cause I really just started going over my day thus far. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, I kind of like most of the actions, but a lot of the thoughts along the way are really not helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, do you kind of have, do you recommend doing it from both perspectives? Like what are you physically doing? And then what are you thinking about what you're doing? Right. So, um, right. You may be using a lot of willpower to overcome what, what's going on internally to do the things you're mm -hmm. doing, but that comes at a cost, right? Cause exerting willpower is exerting energy. It's exhausting. Right. It's exhausting. 
Yeah. It's totally exhausting. So this is what I was, I, this is how I describe it to my clients. I'm like, you're playing whack-a-mole with your thoughts all day. I love the game whack-a-mole, but man, what you just described, tell us more. How does that analogy work for you? You know, let's say you're, you're working on, um, a deck to give a talk and every few minutes your thoughts are like, this is, you know, this isn't going to be good. This is, this isn't coming together. Everything I'm saying is hackneyed. No one's going to be interested in this, or this isn't creative enough or whatever the thoughts are garden variety, negative thoughts about it. Right. And if to can, all of those thoughts create emotions that do not feel good, dread, shame, fear, right. All of those feelings, uh, most of those feelings mm-hmm. lead to actions like procrastinating, hiding, avoiding, right. So if you're in that model, right, if that's what your mental model is, then in order to get yourself to do the thing, you're going to have to be dealing with and wrangling those thoughts all day long. Right. So like that thought pops up and you have to, you have to sort of go to war with it. Right. That's what most people do. Right. That's what I was just sitting here imagining how many people are listening to this on their walk or in their car going, yes, yes. Okay. And then what? Like, because the next obvious thing becomes, okay, solve it for me then. Right. So, <laughs> and you're like, yes, here's my business. Here's what you know, I think there's a couple of things. Like one is if you're really, um, if you're playing to your edge and you're challenging yourself, those thoughts are going to be totally normal, right? Because it's going to feel scary and threatening to sort of step up to a new level that feels scary. So a piece of it is just allowing those thoughts to pop up and those feelings to be there and not attaching anything to it. Like nothing's gone wrong. This just is exactly where I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be feeling this angst. I'm supposed to be feeling insecure. I'm supposed to be feeling all these feelings is totally normal, which is by the way, a new thought. See, I like ninja a new thought in there. No, that's yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Normal. Yeah. There's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing that my brain gen- is generating right now that is real. It's just having a freak out because I'm doing something new. So, hmm. One, you know, what you want to to do and to practice is not to do the like positive, af- in my opinion, not to do the sort of positive affirmation thing. Like, I'm amazing. This is going to be the best talk ever. <laughs> you know, like, right. I, I am like going to blow everybody's mind. No, I mean, th- that might be too far of a reach for most mm-hmm. people. And they just, it feels inauthentic and it doesn't really work. And so then they feel like they're in this like tug of war between like the negative thought and the positive thought. It's like, what if the neutral thought was more like just an acceptance of, oh yeah, this is normal. My brain's going to have a freak out today, but I can experience the feeling of fear for 90 seconds. Like I can have that, buzz, I can feel anxiety. I can have that buzzy feeling in my body and I'm going to be okay. Okay. So that acceptance piece, a little bit like that mindfulness, right? Like I've always enjoyed the analogy that think of your mind as the sky and then your thoughts as clouds and you can just watch them pass. I'm pretty sure I got that from Headspace app, but, uh, and and it makes sense because we, I think many of us have tried that and, and it works. It takes focus, which is hard. It takes effort. And then we revert back to our habits. How do we change the habitual thought process of negativity, not enough, imposter syndrome, all the things that we deal with. Well, I mean, I think you had to really attack it at its root, right? So the root that you have to attack is that all of those thoughts, all of them are made up. You've made up every single one of them, right? So my, one of the thoughts that I practice all the time is that like reminding myself that my thoughts are all made up, all of them. And when I'm in a moment where I'm having that feeling of anxiety or the feeling of fear or the feeling of dread, which happens on the regular, right? Anyone who's trying to grow is going to have those feelings. They come up, right? And asking myself, what thoughts are creating this result? Like, how are my thoughts creating this result right now? So the better you get at being the observer of the thought, as opposed to being in the thought, fighting the thought. Cause the minute you start to fight your thinking, you're already own it. Like you, you, you be, you're anthropomorphizing your thoughts, right? Like all of a sudden they become very real. Right. Right. Cause you're fighting them. You're like, can't think that thought must think this thought. Now you're, you're already in the struggle. Mm-hmm. Right. So what you want to practice more and more is being able to take a step back and be like, okay, I'm feeling this feeling. 
what's the thought that's creating this anxiety or what's the, co- the, the thought that's creating this dread and just being able to be the watcher and observe it. Like that's the, no, that's the first step. That's the first step. And I love that. But I'm curious with all of your background, all of your study, I mean, rooted in science and, and practice, all the things we've done, are some people able to change their thoughts to the point where they don't have to constantly monitor them or ev- I don't know what the word is, monitor, evaluate, separate themselves. When negative thought patterns are so ingrained in us, can we get to the point where positive or helpful thought patterns are ingrained in us? Absolutely. Without question. Yes, we have a negativity bias. I mean, I think that's, you know, most people know that, that our brains are wired to um, attend to negative information over or positive information because it's just a survival mechanism. It's the way your brain is wired. So you have to contend with that. But um, absolutely. I mean, I, anyone who's overcome any kind of addiction, um, they know exactly what that feels like. They, they used to identify as being someone who is, um, you know, a, a particular addict. And then they, they've had enough recovery under their belt. And they're like, oh, it's so crazy. I don't think of myself as even a drinker anymore. Mm. Right? Like, I don't have that. I don't have any thoughts that create the desire for the drug or for the substance. Like it, they have a wholesale change in the way that they think about it. Right. Complete change. Right. From someone who's saying like, you know, smoking, like I, I just crave cigarettes. I want to smoke all the time. Like, you know, quitting, we know is very hard. Right? Statistically, it's difficult for people. Um, and then someone who's quit for long enough and they're like, yeah, God, I don't even think about it. Right. Isn't that crazy? I used to think about it every second of the day. Don't think about it anymore. Huh. I never thought of it in that line. In, but that's a very tangible way of defining or showing the change in thought process. Imposter syndrome, I think, is a really fascinating one because so many people feel this way, right? What about the people who don't feel that? Like here, this is why I always I've asked a few guests this in the past. But when you look at your bio, wh- at what point can you say I have imposter syndrome? It just doesn't rationally make sense. So can you still manufacture that thought? Yes. Oh my lord, yes. And yeah. here's the this is the problem. This is the problem because your brain is wired not to base things on any um objective measure. Mm. Right? But it's it's wired to always we're always assessing things based on a relative scale. Uh, yeah. So the more you achieve, here's the big lie, guys. The more you achieve, the more elite the comparison group gets. So yeah. you never get to enjoy the achievement ever. <laughs> truth. So everyone's like, oh, man, like, I just wish I could achieve that thing. I'd feel so much better about myself. No, you're not. Because the people you're going to be comparing yourself to are also going to be a hell of a lot better. There's a funny research about the Olympics. Like this is a sort of phenomenon where if you look at people, you, you just people Google it and like look it up online. You know, the people that are least happy on the podium are always the silver medalists because the counterfactual for the silver medalist, right? Like the gold medalist obviously is like grinning ear to ear. And so funnily enough is the bronze medal winner. It makes zero sense rationally, right? It should be gold medalist is the happiest second, you know, the silver medalist is second happy and the bronze medalist Mm -hmm. is third happy. Like that's the way it should be, but it's not the way it works because the way the brain interprets that situation is the silver medalist is comparing themselves to the missing the gold. So they're feeling disappointed, right? They lost their shot at the gold medal, the bronze medal, the counterfactual, you know, story is, well, I could have been in fourth place and not even been on the podium, not even got Metal, right. So they're just happy to be there. So the, your mind, um, you know, gets you into trouble. So you have to learn how to manage that. So it's like there is no external um, there's no external accolade that's going to fix that problem. OK, really quick. I'm going to interrupt this interview for a message from one of our sponsors this week. Away creates thoughtful products designed to change how you see the world. They started with the perfect suitcase, and now they offer a range of essentials that solve real travel problems. So all you have to think about is where you're headed next. Now, you may or may not know this, but I fly probably a hundred plus times a year. I honestly haven't added up the miles, but it is insane. And it's funny because just last week I went to the wrong airport. Yes, 
I live close enough to two airports that I pulled up to Dulles, get to the security line, and they tell me, sir, you're supposed to be at Reagan. Needless to say, I missed my flight, spent a few hundred dollars in change fees, a few extra hours in the airport, and wasn't pleased. Those unexpected hours drained my battery. Luckily, my new away carry-on has a built-in battery that also ejects with the push of a button so you can carry it with you and it meets all TSA requirements. That's just one feature of these suitcases. They are super lightweight. Oh, and if your bag ever gets damaged, they will fix it or replace it for free. Look, I could go on about the different parts about Away, the 360 degree spinner wheels, the removable laundry bag that comes with it. But really, I just want to say this. I travel all the time. And this is one thing that has made my travel easier, faster, and more organized. For $20 off a suitcase, visit awaytravel.com slash smart and use promo code smart during checkout. Again, for 20 bucks off a suitcase, go to awaytravel.com slash smart and use promo code smart during checkout. Now let's get back to this awesome episode. Let's take this silver medal example, because we mentioned how the first step, and I, I really liked how you explained it, that first step of observing it. You can't do anything until you realize what's going on. Is this helpful, useful, etc.? But once we observe it, do we have to go to a deeper place and ask, why does this medal matter so much to me? And I mean, straying from that analogy, just thinking of everyone in life, right? If we are striving for something, whether we accomplish it or not, do you think it's almost more important to ask why are we striving for that thing? And not only why, but can I get what I want without that thing in the first place? Yeah. I mean, I think the why is, is, you know, is an absolutely, you know, is deeply important because if, if the reason that if what's motivating you is sort of back to the, you know, in, in extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation, but if the thing that's motivating you has, is extrinsic, if it's an ex extrinsically motivated goal, then the not, you know, not hitting the, uh, the top, not hitting the top or not being the best would feel like a massive disappointment. Right. But if the goal is, um, about showing up as your best and you knew that that day, like you put it all out there on the, whatever on the course, or you did, you, you absolutely gave it your all right then. And it, if, if you're really, it's an intrinsically motivated goal, then it's like, yeah, I, I showed up for myself. I did it. I'm really proud of myself. Right. But it, it, it requires, there is no magic pill. Like it requires a ton of work. I mean, I think that I, I was just, I'm trying to do more running lately. And I did a half marathon this past weekend and I am not a fast runner. It's I'm it's I'm not I'm not gonna win any awards for being a fast runner, right? Like I'm a just slow jogger at best. And he, what's so interesting is like if I had just done a 13.1 mile training run, I would have been like, Yeah, look at you. You just did 13 miles, so proud of you. Like you're you set the you know, you, you're following through on your plan, your training plan. I would have been really pleased with myself. Right. But then you put me in a competitive situation where all of a sudden now I have other people that are running with me. My time is being publicly recorded, et cetera, et cetera. And I am having to manage the hell out of my mind. Yeah. Right. Because all of a sudden there's all these thoughts like I should be better than I am. You know, this is embarrassing. If people know that I'm such <laughs> whatever, I don't know. Yeah. Like, people know I'm a slow runner or, um, you know, I, one thought I found was like, oh man, if I was more mentally tough, I'd be a faster runner. And I was like, oh, that's fascinating. Where did that thought come from? Right. So it ended up being this, the entire race was me like having to sit there and observe all these wacky thoughts that were popping through my brain. I mean, I love the slant you take towards it, almost like an investigator, right? Because it does remove yourself like, whoa, that's weird. I wonder where that came from. Where so many of us, myself included, I just thought of one that happens all the time with me. I'll just latch onto that and be like, that is me. You're right. Yeah. Brain. <laughs> right. So I, like, I then take, you know, and I, what was so interesting to me was that after the race was finished, like I wanted to run and hide. People were like, yeah, way to go. I'm like, oh my God, I just want to go home. You know, like yeah. it was so embarrassed. I felt so embarrassed and it was such a weird feeling because I'm sitting there going, okay, 
logically, realistically, I did exactly what I set out to do. I, I ran, it was, I was using this as like a training opportunity, right? I showed up, I did it. I should have been a to- pig and slop. Like I should have been really proud of myself. I followed through on exactly what I set out to do, but I would, my brain was not letting me have that experience of pride, which feels great. It feels awesome to be proud of yourself. I could not access that because I was so mired in all of these thoughts of like, you know, I'm not good enough. I should be more, I should be further along. I should be better at this than I am. I've already put in so much effort. Why am I not faster? Like my brain was just off to the races. And I was like, this is so fascinating. You know, that this is like, I put myself in a situation where, uh, you know, it like kicked up, it kicked up some dirt. This idea of extrinsic versus intrinsic values, motivation, goals, I think is really tough because, and I've thought about this for over a decade, extrinsic goals or extrinsic motivators are told to you. And so it's easier. Intrinsic, although we often think, okay, I know that I want this thing or or I know that I should follow what I value. It's really hard to know if those things are authentic or if they are still skewed by these stories. How do you, how do you help people uncover their true values and their true intrinsic motivators? It is a work in progress. And I think a lot of it has to do with how kids were raised and a lot of the messages they got as kids, you know? So, uh, for some people they were raised in families that were very nurturing and supportive of the child's own interests and passions and desires. And, and, and that, that just was the way that their parents were. Um, some kids grow up in environments where there's much more what we call like introjected belief systems, right? So um, a child takes on a parent's belief system without even, like totally identifies with it, right? Without even realizing it. Mm-hmm. So, they, so their parents are no longer telling them what to do or what they care about or what's important in life. But they've internalized that voice, right? They've internalized that narrative in their mind. And it takes, um, you know, it takes some serious work to parse that out. What does the work look like for those of us that haven't done the work for those of us that don't have a coach, you know, how do we start to uncover it? I mean, I'm really coming from, imagine that person. I imagine myself at 25 or whatever it was when I'm at that brick wall, you know, I really like the example you gave earlier of, I'm just not motivated. I'm just done, whatever it is. And you say, good, this is time to heal. What's the work from there look like? I mean, I think when the, a good indicator is that, do you have areas in your, you know, does one have areas in their life where they're like their petulant child is really active, right? Like the resistor, the part of them that's like putting their, digging their heels in is like, I don't want to do this. If that's the case, then yes, there are, there's probably some, I, I guarantee that there's some kind of narrative there, which is I must, I should, I ought to. And there's a part of you that's like, I don't want to do this. Hmm. I don't really care. This is not really for me, but it takes a lot. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard because it also sometimes means that you have to be go against the grain, right? Sometimes it means that you have to take a stand that people in your milieu or the people in your sort of, you know, in your family or in your cultural context may not be enthusiastic about. Right. Right. Um, but I think a good place to start again, like when you begin to look at like, what is, you know, always asking yourself, like, what's the emotion that this thought's creating for me? Does it create excitement, curiosity, interest? Does it generate a positive? Is it, is it like, do I feel pulled towards it or do I feel different emotions like dread, anxiety, resistance, right? All of Mm -hmm. those things like, okay, what's going on? Would you say one thing I've found over my life thus far is that dread, anxiety, resistance is actually almost never a good indicator of if I actually want to do something or not. It's simply my default. So I've thought about jobs that I've ended up really enjoying or Mm -hmm. challenges I've taken on, you know, and I'll get worked up, think worst case scenario oftentimes. Mm -hmm. Uh, In the past, I think I might take the easy way out and be like, okay, Chris, listen to your body, listen to your mind. This is a signal. It's not yours. I then realized, no, that's, it's actually a liar. It's pretty much full of shit, to be honest. A, do you run into that? And then B, 
from a psychologist perspective, or even when you're doing coaching, how do you help people unravel? Hey, is this an area you really, it's just not what you want to do. It's not at your core or is it, this is just resistance you've created. I think that's a good example with you at work. Like what was the, what were the thoughts that were creating that anxiety and dread for you? Mm, that's a good point. Yeah. I, I'll, oftentimes it would go back to things like, um, imposter syndrome, right? Like I, I'm not good enough to be here. I'm not good enough to do this. There's smarter people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Follow that line of thinking. Okay. Right. So again, every single piece of that, that whole train of thought is all externally. It's an all like external mm. drama, right? It's all about, mm. like, they're going to judge me. They're going to find me wanting. I'm not going to live up to whatever their expectations are. I'm not capable of living up to their expectations. They're going to find out that I'm really, you know, a gilded right, piece of right. shit. Right. What I mean is like, you know, the dread and the anxiety and the resistance, like it, that that's sometimes is a good indicator of when you've got extrinsic stuff going on. And that's exactly what those thoughts are. Right. Instead of just sitting there it, turning those thoughts around, I'm doing this because I and then fill in the blank. I want to because blank. I, I think I can help add value. I can use my strengths. This is going to be amazing because I'm going to get to grow. Right. Like I just turned in an application for something and it was fascinating because I have turned in a number of applications <laughs> in my life. I've been in school for all. So, um, and there are ones that you turn in and you're like, oh, you're absolutely riddled with anxiety that they're going to judge you and that you, they're going to, you know, you, you have people looking at you and deeming you worthy or not. Right. That's what's happening. Yes. She gets in. No, she doesn't. And it would be riddled with anxiety and fear and then there are times when I turn in or do something like that. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm just super excited to have this opportunity. Right. Like, I got this opportunity. I would grow. I would develop. I would mature in my thinking. Like, I, this is going to be such an amazing opportunity. And so when I'm in that mindset, when, when I'm there, when I'm inhabiting that mindset, I don't feel anxious. I don't feel that dread and resistance. I feel like curiosity, excitement, and I'm eager. I'm psyched. And I think like, okay, if I don't get it. I'll do it again right. or I'll figure out how to get that growth or whatever the learning or the opportunity that I wanted in a different way. Like I'm, I am able to access more creative thinking. You know, I apologize if you're going to hear this and go, yeah, Chris, what do you think we've been talking about for an hour? But I had a little moment here, which I think in the simplest form was if you want to lower the perhaps stress or anxiety around your decision making or your thought process, it really, it's just once you know who you are, then you can know what your, and I'm going to call them goals, but what your aspirations are. And then if you make decisions based off of those aspirations rather than outcomes or others' opinions, it's going to be a lot more smooth sailing, again, regardless of what happens. Yeah, definitely. Right. I mean, if you're, you're like, if you are truly doing it for your growth and to, imp to improve you, right? you want to evolve. You are like, this is, this is an opportunity to take me to another level. Then it doesn't have that same feeling of like, oh my God, I'm, I'm up. And there's, you know, the 10 Russian judges are about to give me the numbers. <laughs> right. And now a quick break from the episode for a few words from this week's sponsor. When you're selling online, getting your orders out can be a real pain. It's time consuming, expensive. There's so many carriers to choose from. How do you know you're making the best choice? That's why you need ShipStation.com. It's the fastest, easiest, and most affordable way to manage and ship your orders. ShipStation is awesome, and it's a breeze to set up. It's literally four steps. You pick your selling channel, you pick your shipping carrier, you pick your label layout, and you choose your ship from location. That's it. You're up and running. ShipStation helps you get out orders quickly, saving money on shipping costs and keeping your customers happy. No matter what you're selling, whether you're on Amazon, Etsy, your own website, ShipStation brings all your orders into one simple interface. This makes it really easy to manage from any device, even your cell phone. ShipStation works with all the major carriers, including USPS, FedEx, UPS, and even Amazon Fulfillment. So you can compare and choose the best shipping solution for you and your customer. No wonder ShipStation is the number one choice of online sellers. You'll ship more in less time with the best rates available. And right now, Smart People Podcast listeners can try ShipStation free for 60 days when you use offer code SMART. 
There's absolutely no risk. You can start your free trial without even entering your credit card info. So why wait? Get started today. Just visit ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in SMART. That's ShipStation.com, then enter offer code SMART. ShipStation.com. Make ship happen. And now back to the episode. You know, it's like blowing my mind about this. I mentioned I had an interview earlier this morning and I was talking to this economist who proposes basically a new theory of economics. I mean, it's it's pretty fascinating. His take is there are many things we do just for the sake of living. He calls it will. It's really interesting. He was essentially as an economist saying it's OK to do things for the sake of doing them. And that is actually part of our rational mind. And then. Here you are saying something very similar, and it's just hitting me because if you stop trying to make all decisions based on desired outcomes, optimizing your time and energy and money, honestly, you're living a little bit more authentic of a life, which will lead to better results regardless of the true outcome. Yeah. I mean, I think it takes a lot of work for people to stay conscious, right? It's very easy for us to be like, Oh God, like I'm feeling a negative emotion. I don't want to feel like, uh, let me distract myself. Right. Right. Sh- right. Shoot me up with some n- emotional Novocaine. Like, I'm yeah. sorry. Where's, where's the snack? Where's my Instagram feed? You know, where is the glass of whatever the cocktail after work? Right. It's like, we want to distract ourselves in any way we can. Right. So it, it's very hard. It, it does take, well, it's not easy. It takes a lot of work to sit with yourself and be like, Ooh, okay, what am I feeling? What's the source of this emotion? What am I telling myself that's making me feel this way? Is that a thought that I like? Is mm-hmm. that a thought that does like, is, is helping me? Is that a helpful thought? Or is that a thought that just is I've made up and isn't helping me at all? It makes me feel terrible. Right. But it's what I think is so interesting. What it is that, Intrinsic and extrinsic motivation are just thoughts and they're always available to us. There's always an intrinsic reason to do something. And then there's also an extrinsic reason to do something. It's like, what's the story you're going to pick, right? Mm. So like, as I said, like I wanted to, if I was doing a 13 mile training run, it would have been for me by myself. Nobody knows. And I would have been super proud of myself. Why? Because I'm telling myself that I'm awesome because I've followed through on my plan, right? Look at you. You said miles. It was on your training regimen. You did it. Yay, you. You know, enjoy the rest of your afternoon, right? Enjoy your Saturday. But the second I got into a different, like same, same exact same circumstances, thirteen miles. But I'm now doing it in the context of a race, right? And all of a sudden, like I could feel that extrinsic. Like my extrinsic uh, orientation is finely tuned, right? So here, all of a sudden, I'm like, whoa, isn't that interesting? Like this whole other it's like a part of my brain woke up. Right. And so it was generating a totally different narrative, right. Which is compared to these people, you're not good enough. You know, this is, you're a lame runner. I mean, it was the dumbest stuff that was, I was just like, Oh my gosh, if anyone had a recording of what is going on in my brain, like this would be amazing. (laughs) Right. So it's so interesting how it's like same circumstances and I, but I have a choice and that's what you get better and more skillful at, right. Is being able to interrupt pattern interrupt. Like, okay, that's my pattern feels that fueling my achievements from that place of like not enoughness. And I got to, you know, got to hustle more, got to do more, got to be better so that people think I'm worthy. Like uh, fueling yourself from that place is exhausting. Man, get out of my head. (laughs) I mean, you know, what's funny about it, even though I think oftentimes it can drive you to do more and, and that look, that's probably a story in and of itself. Yeah. It's it's so hard. Like it can drive you like a freight train. Right. I was just thinking that it can drive you real hard, but in what direction and through what and how are you going to how much are you going to have left at the end? This is why, again, I think that the, the conversation about mental health, like mental health, true well-being. Right. It's much more nuanced than, you know, set big goals, go after them, like achieve. Right. It's no, it's more nuanced than that, because. It mat the reason that you want to achieve all these things is so you can feel better. That's what you're telling yourself. When I achieve this, I'll feel good. Right. But yeah, not, but the fueling of that process is miserable. So then there's a larger existential question of like, why, 
Why? Right. Exactly. So why do it? I think that, you know, the, the work is, is really is to get to know yourself, to understand what is fueling you, what is driving you. And it takes a ton of trial and error. And it takes a lot of putting yourself in situations like this silly little race this weekend, which gave me a lot of information it was very useful. Like I was like, oh, that's, mm. I didn't anticipate any of the learning I would just get from doing that you know, for a couple hours on my Saturday morning, but right. Right. Putting yourself in situations and recognizing like, Oh, so interesting. Like when I'm running for me, I, it feels awesome when I'm running with all this nonsense in my brain and it's being fueled from that place. It feels dreadful, truly. Right. Right. And so being able and then recognizing that I have a lot more control over what narrative I'm telling myself than I think I do. Well, and you, and I love that you mentioned this idea of which story am I going to pick? There's always like, for example, there's that extrinsic intrinsic, which one do I want to pick? It's always there. I think just even understanding that can be refreshing or it can be empowering. I think we overblow the, or the role of willpower, but I think that the real discipline is not in the doing. I think the discipline is in disciplining yourself to a particular narrative. Because your brain is going to want to go be like, wait a minute, but that's really not true. It's this. Here's, you know, like you're working on, a, you know, you're working on something, a deliverable for work and your brain is, you know, you're like, okay, you know, this is an amazing opportunity because I am get to learn so much and I'm growing. And even if I get feedback that isn't the most glowing, like I'm going to grow from this, I'm going to learn from this and I'm going to become the, you know, professional that I really want to be. If like that's, is fueling you from a place of, intrinsic motivation, your brain is going to want to go down the road of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're an idiot, but it's stupid, but everyone else is better than you. Right. So the, I think that the real work is the discipline is in bringing your, you know, the, it's like training a puppy, right? Like it's bringing lovingly, bringing that puppy back to the newspaper. Like we're not going to piddle all over the floor. We're bringing it back to the newspaper. So, so wait, let me just be clear. Cause I think this is a huge part. What you're saying is let's go back to these two stories, right? There's two stories. It's not really in picking one that is going to do everything, but it's more in this continual reminder of, uh, bring you back towards a story that is more authentic to you. The values, the, the love, the kindness, the, what you are seeking to achieve in your time here, et cetera, et cetera. Is that, is that right? Uh, yes. Okay. Like just the fundamental belief that you have a choice. Like if you really own that, you really believe that, that will change your life. Couldn't agree more. Well, I know we have to let you go, but I can't let you go yet because I promised our listeners a few things. One is I have three listener questions. You can answer them as rapid fire as you would like. Um, okay. Okay. So the first one, and I'm actually going to modify it slightly because it leads to something we were talking about earlier. So I'm going to use the language we've been using. How do you constrain yourself when you want to accomplish so much in your time here. And I, I don't mean for ex extrinsic purposes. I mean, when you truly are curious of so much and you want to really maximize your time, it can become overwhelming. That paradox of choice. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts or recommendations there? Um, yes. Two things. One is as a, like a, a lover of learning, I totally understand. I just love to learn. I'm just really a curious person in that regard. And so I get it, but I think sometimes we can use passive learning. So consuming information in the same way we use consuming other substances to numb out. So be careful of that, yes. right? Like, are, am I using this information to move me forward? Or am I using this as just a way of kind of avoiding having to take an uncomfortable action? Yeah. Love that. Um, and then secondly, I would say when it comes to goals, right, I think it's true. We can, we can do a do ourselves a disservice by setting too many goals at one time. So I would say, you know, pick a goal that subsumes the other goals. So you would have to like, you would have to grow and evolve as a person to the big, the, the, like the big bodacious goal you're going for would require you to clean up a lot of other areas in your life. Right. So like the littler goals become in service of this one big goal. I love it. Um, next is this. What advice would you give? And this might not be in your warehouse wheelhouse. So take it where you would like. But uh, if you have an adult child who refuses to launch 
And again, maybe you can take it from a parenting perspective or not, but however you would like. But what do you recommend as a parent to adult children who are not ready to launch, leave the nest or own their own results and, and go out there and be a productive member of society? I would, uh, the advice of the parent. The advice to the parent. Yeah. This is a parent. Um, the parent, I would say the first, the only person that you can change is you. So the, the worrying and the like micromanaging and obsessing about your child is a distraction from dealing with what's going on with you internally. Um, and the question that I would pose is, right, if, if your child is, is sort of failure to launch and not taking responsibility for their actions, I would give you the exact same question, which is where are you not taking responsibility for your actions with this kid? How, let me ask you, how does that relate? Like, I've always thought about this. It's a real struggle. If you have a kid, you love them. Let's say they're in your house, right? They won't go get a job for whatever reason, mental issues or not. That's not the point. But how do you do that? You know, when you turn the mirror on yourself, but you're thinking, no, but this is about them. I want them to thrive. Right. But I think that the question would be is like, what if, if I, you know, the question that I would give them is like, if you believe that your child was competent and whole, like it was your, your child was capable, how would you show up as a parent? What would you do? Ah, I see. How are you, right? Because I think what parents don't realize is like they, we give our kids messages all the time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So like I, I have to do it for you is a message of you can't do it yourself. Right. So where if you really believe that you're if you're like, I want them to fly the coop there. Like, I want them to have their own life. I want them to be independent. Like, if you really believe that they were capable, how would you show up? What would you do? Mm -hmm. Probably differently. Sure. All right. Last one, Sasha. What are the things we should do to not get stuck in the first place? I know you help people get unstuck, but what are some things we can do to just feel like we're 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 progressing the way we want instead of getting stuck? I I it's I think actually think it's more simple than people think. The one thing that you need to do to avoid getting stuck is being willing to experience your emotions. What gets us stuck is avoiding our feelings. All of our nonsense behavior, all the distraction, all the like, you know, insanity that we do that gets us into trouble and creates more chaos in our lives is our sort of simplistic way of trying to distract ourselves from feeling something we don't want to feel in the moment. Wow. That's, you know what, that's a great place to end because now I know myself and Claire, I'm just up there in my head going, I need to journal. Like as soon as we, as soon as we end this conversation, I just have to write what's going on in my head. Cause there's so much there. Yeah. Well, Sasha, I, First of all, thank you so much. This has been incredible. So fun. I love it. Um, your website is drsashahines.com. I want to mm -hmm. just give some time to you because, you know, you are this force out there. You're working with people, coaching people. Um, where, can, where else should we find you? What call to action? You know, can we work with you? All of those things. Um, oh my, you're awesome. I am on Instagram, uh, the sort of where I might for musings and what's in <laughs> watching my, watching my running journey. You can come hang out with me on Instagram. Uh, same handle. It's at D R S A S H A H E I N Z. Um, and yeah, and then I work with clients one-on-one. -on -one. I, I, I really love that intimacy of working with someone one-on-one. -on -one. I, you know, I think that, um, when someone's really ready to roll up their sleeves and do the work and it's not easy because you're going to feel all the stuff, all the stuff, you know, all the inadequacy, all the incompetence, all of the shame and fear and all the stuff that's there, uh, you know, like all feeling all of those things and getting good at feeling those things. It's what's, that's, what's required, um, to achieve your goals. That's it. That's the work. That's the work. I was just thinking in my head, that's the work. And they can, we can all go to your website if we need to get in touch with you or if we want to work with you. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. There's an application on my website and, uh, and get, people can connect with me there. All right. Dr. Sasha Hines.com is the website again. Sasha, again, thank you so much for your time and being on the show. You left us all with a lot to think about. So much fun. Thanks so much. And another interview in the books. Hope you enjoyed that episode with Dr. Sasha Hines. 
Dr. Hines can be found on our website at drsashahines.com or on Instagram at instagram.com slash drsashahines. And that's D-R-S-A-S-H-A-H-E-I-N-Z. And as always, if you enjoy the show and want to help support us, you can head over to iTunes or Apple Podcasts and leave a rating and review on the show. Or you can use our Amazon link located at smartpeoplepodcast.com slash Amazon. Any purchase you make through that link comes at no extra cost to you, and it greatly helps support the show. If you'd like to reach out to us, you can email us at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or message us on Twitter at smartpeoplepod. And of course, you can sign up for the newsletter at smartpeoplepodcast.com. All right, that's it for us this week. Make sure you stay tuned. We've got a lot of great interviews coming up. And we will see you all next episode.